Through the ages, humans have resolved disputes by fighting with one another. And this was also true in the Middle Ages, when judiciary duels were often held. Known as trial by combat or battle by combat, it was seen as a chivalric way to settle a dispute. If an accusation was made against someone without a witness or a confession, fighting in single combat was the only way to recognise who was right and who was wrong. Medieval duels were not just about brute strength, they were often about nerve and cunning. Here we will travel back in time to take a look at this medieval mode of justice and hear about some of the more famous medieval duels. But before we get into today's video, I'd like to take a moment to give a shout out to History Hit for working with us on our channel. We honestly can't say enough good things about them, but if you've been living in the Middle Ages and somehow don't know who they are yet, History Hit is an incredible platform similar to Netflix, but jam-packed with documentaries, podcasts and articles about all your favourite historical eras. Their award-winning podcast network includes gems like Gone Medieval and Dan Snow's History Hit. And their online history channel has hundreds of hours of original history documentaries too. All of this is brought to you by expert historians with 19 new podcast episodes and two new programs being released every single week. When you sign up, you can download the app onto your phone so you can watch anywhere, anytime, on any device like your smart TV, tablet, or your phone. Recently, I've had to take some long train trips, so I've used the time to catch up on some of the documentaries I miss. Speaking of, if you're a fan of this channel, you have to check out Dr. Eleanor Yanaga's documentary called Exploring the Medieval Afterlife. As medieval history nerds, we love the depth of knowledge that she brings to a fascinating subject, understanding what people were afraid of and how that shaped society. But there's one thing that you absolutely shouldn't be afraid of, and that's subscribing to History Hit. They've actually brought us all a very special discount. The code HISTORYHIT will get you a whopping 60% off your first six months. This means you can subscribe to History Hit for less than £3 a month. That's less than a Starbucks coffee and you'll get more enjoyment out of this subscription. Promise. Click the link in the subscription box below to find out more and subscribe to History Hit. Now for today's video. Welcome to Medieval Madness. In Europe, determining the guilt or innocence of a person by a court-sanctioned duel dates back to around the 7th century with the first recorded case of Wolstan vs Walter. It is not known who won the case. By the 10th century, the practice had been officially authorised by Otto the Great across the Holy Roman Empire. In the 1230 legal code known as the Sachsenspiegel, those involved in duels were forbidden from wearing shoes, heavy gloves or helmets, although they should be provided with shields and swords. If the accused didn't show up, they were believed to be guilty. It was particularly popular when establishing the guilt of those accused of theft, injury or insult. As it was presumed that God would be on the side of the person who was in the right, it's a puzzle as to which man he would support when it came to the duel between two abbots. In 1251, the Abbot of Moe and the Abbot of St. Mary's York decided to have a pop at one another and each one chose a champion as their representative. Hiring a defender didn't come for free though, and the fighters had to be paid. They were the equivalent of a courtroom lawyer really, except they used fists instead of words to win the case. Moe paid an absolute fortune for his warrior, but when it looked as though his man was going to be beaten, he chose to negotiate and the argument was settled before the fight even ended. Calling a King's Bluff King Edward III of England himself offered King Philippe VI outside for some fisticuffs in 1415, when he challenged the French ruler to a personal duel of their two bodies. But Philippe was almost 50 years old, unlike Edward, who at only 28 was in the prime of his life. Edward thought that, quote, Shedding their own human blood would spare the many, and that they might bring an end to that controversy in a duel between them. Edward knew that the challenge would never be accepted, so he made himself look like a great and brave king, one willing to spare his own people any more fighting by risking his own life. Really though, there was never any risk at all, and it was just a great piece of propaganda. It's worth noting that as in the previous story of the two abbots, not every duel ended in a death. Sometimes weapons were chosen especially for their non-lethal qualities, like the quarter staff, which was a short pike. Of course, any fight can lead to a fatality if that is the intention. 
but during a duel, either fighter could just give up if they thought the downside to losing was better than being killed, or they could be removed from the fight if they were knocked senseless. Like the one man whose tale was chronicled by the English monk Jocelyn of Bracelond, Rayleigh, Henry of Essex, served as the royal constable for King Henry II. During Henry's campaign into Wales of 1157, Rayleigh dropped the royal standard during an ambush. His office meant that he should have held the standard aloft at all times to indicate the position of the king. Lowering it singled Henry's death and caused great confusion. A royal court was held and there Rayleigh was accused of treason by Robert of Montfort. A judicial duel was set to be fought between the two men carried out on Fry's Island in the River Thames at Reading. Rayleigh was knocked unconscious during the duel and he was carried to safety by some monks from the nearby Reading Abbey. He stayed there to recover, becoming a Benedictine monk himself. His offices and estates were forfeited and his family was disgraced, as Rayleigh, though still alive, by losing the duel had been automatically convicted as a traitor. The Murder of Charles the Good Galbert of Bruges recorded the story of how Charles, Count of Flanders, was murdered in 1127, and the chaos and bloodshed that occurred after his death. In 1125, a famine affected his land, so Charles distributed bread to the poor. He also prevented the hoarding of grain and put an end to any price gouging. After expelling the Jews, who he believed were guilty of price hiking, he also began taking measures against the powerful Arambold family for the same crime, reducing their status to serfs. This resulted in the Provost of the Church of Saint Donation, Friar Bertolt Fitzimbald organising a plot to assassinate Charles. While Charles was kneeling in prayer at the church on the 2nd of March 1127, a group of knights entered and using broadswords, they hacked him to death. The Count was popular with the people and the violent and blasphemous way in which he was murdered triggered a public outcry. Each knight responsible was captured and tortured to death at the castle of Bruges by commoners and nobles alike. As hard as iron. Guy of Steenvoord, who was described as a famous and strong knight, was accused of being part of the plot. He provided a place of refuge after the murder for his brother-in-law Isaac, who was one of the conspirators. Although Galber denied the allegation, another knight named Herman the Iron stepped forward to challenge Guy to a trial by combat. In the town of Ypres, the two men went out to a nearby farm, followed by a crowd of onlookers to carry out the duel. Galbe tells us that the men, quote, both fought bitterly, but Guy knocked his adversary from his horse and kept him down easily with his lance as he was struggling to get up. Then his opponent, running nearer, ran Guy's horse through with his sword, disemboweling it. Sliding from the horse, his sword drawn, Guy attacked his adversary. A continuous and bitter encounter followed with exchanges of sword blows until worn out by the weight and burden of their arms, they threw away their shields and hastened to win the fight with their strength in wrestling. I and Herman fell prostrate to the ground, and Guy threw himself on top of him, pounding the knight's mouth and eyes with his iron gauntlet. But just as one reads of Antheus, the prostrate man gathered strength bit by bit from the coolness of the ground, and slyly made Guy think he was certain of victory whilst he rested. Meanwhile, having raised his hand very smoothly to the lower edges of the male coat where Guy was unprotected, and grabbed him by the testicles. He collected his strength for a single effort, and threw him from him, breaking open all of the lower parts of his body by this grabbing throw so that the prostrate guy grew weak and cried out that he was defeated and was going to die. Herman the Iron had won and seemed to be guilty in the eyes of God. Guy of Steenford, who was dying anyway, was then dragged to the gallows to be finished off properly and hanged there. Galbe of Bruges continued to write his riveting chronicle that is filled with other stories of political machinations, war, and combat. Padam In the late 14th century and well into the 15th, a new type of martial game began. A group of knights would stake out a well-travelled place such as a bridge or city gate. They would tell any other knights who wanted to pass by that they must first take part in a duel. There are records of thousands of past dams during this time. One of the most famous involved the Spanish knight Suero de Quinones, who established a passage of honour at the Orbigo Bridge in 1434 in the Kingdom of Leon, 
with 10 other knights, Suero swore that he would break 300 lances before he would give up. The jousting went on for a month. After 166 battles, Suero's knights retired because they were too badly injured to continue, although they declared themselves victorious. The bigger they come. Single combat played a huge part in tournaments and jousts, but it was in a war-type setting where these fights got particularly violent, usually taking place at the beginning of a battle when opposing champions would square up to one another. The English chronicler Geoffrey the Baker describes what happened at the Battle of Hallandon Hill in 1333. Quote, a Scottish champion of enormous size took his stand in the middle of the armies and challenged any Englishman to fight him in combat. From the opposition ranks, Sir Robert Benhill, a knight from Norfolk on bended knee, sought a blessing from the king, and attacked the giant with a sword and shield. A black mastiff accompanied and helped the Scottish champion. Sir Robert, with one stroke of his sword, cut the dog's loins and back into two halves. At this, the dog's master came on more rashly, and the knight cut off first his left fist, and then his head. Baker continues that during the Hundred Year War in 1346 at the Battle of Poitiers, it was customary for the French and English to joust before the main event, and knights from the English vanguard were chosen especially for the job. Robert the Bruce vs Henry de Bowen Another famous battlefield duel took place on the first day of the Battle of Bannockburn. The clash of armies was part of the First War of Scottish Independence from England and was fought over two days in June 1314. The King of the Scots, Robert the Bruce, and his army met the English King Edward II and his men, in the hope that Bruce would legitimise his kingship by defeating Edward. The two English cavalry formations advanced forwards towards the Scots, who were in position beyond the burn or stream. Sir Henry de Bowen was the grandson of the second Earl of Hereford and an English knight. He was riding in the vanguard of the cavalry. Suddenly, he spotted Robert the Bruce among the men. Having ventured ahead of his main body of troops, Bruce was only kitted out for a scouting mission with light armor, a small horse, and just a battle axe for defense. On seeing this, Bohun, who was in full combat gear, saw his chance, and lowering his lance, he charged straight at the Scottish king. Bruce stood his ground and rode on towards his opponent, the two men hurtling towards one another. But at the last moment, Bruce very deftly moved his horse to one side. Dodging the lance and standing up in his stirrups, he brought his axe down so hard onto Bowen's head that it penetrated his helmet and split his skull. Rebuked by his generals for risking his life in single combat, Robert the Bruce's only regret was that he had broken the shaft of his best axe. On seeing Bohun fall, Scottish morale was boosted, and they were able to push back the advancing English. Even when the second cavalry force advanced, they were forced to withdraw, and despite the English having over four times as many men, the Scots were victorious at Bannockburn. Bruce was respected for his bravery and leadership by his men in what has become a celebrated instance of single combat. It wasn't until 1819 that the English Parliament finally outlawed any form of judicial duelling, finding them, quote, oppressive, and the trial by battle, unfit to be used. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe to the channel if you enjoy learning about medieval history, and I'll see you next Friday for another video. Happy New Year's!